Once you've ruled out the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. And it is not a question of a little occultism or a touch of mysticism, Mr. Devon. It is vampires, and there's a host of damned souls at Pella House. Here, the old gods aren't dead. And what of the true god? Well, he's dead. He can't complain. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. You're listening to Paranormal UK Radio. Hi everybody, this is Irene Allen Block, the host of the Paranormal UK radio show, the flagship show to the Paranormal UK radio network. And I've forgotten who I'm with. <laughs> I shouldn't do this. I'm Scott. This is the <laughs> second show in a row you've forgotten me. <laughs> You know, you see, uh, it's not that Mark, Mark Johnson, everybody, Mark Johnson. Oh, why, thank you. Isn't it? Honestly, honestly, I I feel honored you remember. But, you know, this has been going on for 10 years. But for some reason, the powers to be block me when I come to introduce you. So why are they doing it? Capiccio? Hmm. Maybe I'm going by a different name. Makes you think. On another dimension, and, and it's screwing you up. Yeah, it could be. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> or they just like messing with you. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. But you know, I do. do I do get your name sometimes. I think it's because I like the words and the name Markle Farkle. <laughs> so when it comes to introducing you as Mark Johnson, my brain wants to do, or my mouth wants to. Do it as Markle Farkle. So I never should brain, have ever told you that. <laughs> then my brain blocks, sweetie. It literally <laughs> cuts off because it can't cope. It knows it's Mark Johnson, but the mouth is coming out with Markle Farkle. Okay. Well, now that we have that out of the way. Yes. <laughs> uh, like I said, never should have told you my aunts used to call me that, but... Yeah. Oh, good Lord. Um, so what's new here? What do we have going on? You're coming to the UK. That's right. Oh, God. Finally. <clears throat> He's coming, people, to visit me here in the UK. Now, now here... staying, staying with me and uh, touring about for a couple of weeks. With you and Brian and your sons mm. and and yeah. uh, meet, meeting many of our other radio show hosts here on the station who live over there. So, yes, hopefully they'll be coming to stay at my house as well. So, if I haven't got enough beds, I'm going to put them on the floor. There you go. Mm. As long as the ghosts don't step on them. <laughs> Yes. Well, this is what I, what's what's really ironic. We we have been working together for well over ten years, and we have never met in person. So. Well, this is it. We've done radio programs. Um, publishing. You yes. know, we've done. Uh, Unknown Origins Radio. Par- paranormal um, investigations God, with SRI. I mean, yeah. we have done so much together, and yet we've always been separated by an ocean. Thank God. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, you're going to have me for a week, so. (laughs) Uh, No, nearly two weeks. About 10 days. Wow. Yep, so you're stuck with me. You know, if we get bored over here, we can always hop a plane and fly over to Italy. You know, we could. Mm. And I wouldn't complain. Neither would I. (laughs) Oh, good Lord. Well, I'm looking forward to it, so. Oh, I'm glad someone is. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Meow. Well, since, since you're going to be so snarky, we might as well get on with the show then. Yes, we have a lovely gentleman. Who is it, Mark? Yes. Well, our guest tonight is Adam Gell. Now, Adam 
is a retired high school physical education teacher working in the public school system for over 30 years. He also worked as a landscape photographer, writer, documentary filmmaker, and he currently hosts his own podcast. Now, what I'm really fascinated with Adam is the fact that he works with the Akashic Records and he does past life regressions and healings and he got into all, he's a Reiki practitioner and mentor. So, Adam, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, Adam. Adam, can you explain about the records for people that don't know anything or never heard of them? Sure. Um, well, the, the Akashic Records are a uh, an energy field. And it's a vibrational library, like located in like in the fifth dimension, and not an actual physical library, but it contains all the information of the universe from uh, all beings from the beginning of time and space. Uh, it's re referred to in the Bible as the Book of Life. Uh, Edgar Case, who was the sleeping prophet, used the Akashic Records to access information for his clients while he was sleeping. Uh, but many people who read the Akashic Records uh, wind up accentuating their spiritual growth, their healing, wisdom, and, and development, personal development, by accessing the information from this energy. Um, just on a quick note, the energy itself is in the fifth dimension. It's a vibrational field that we access. In Hindu, it's called the ether. It's the space between space that records all of our actions all of our verbal, uh, the verbal things we speak, things we act, and the things we think, they vibrate into the into the akasha and they get stored there. Okay, lovely, no. Mark. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, first of all, my my first because actually I want to touch on that when I want to get back to that because I have some an interesting question for you. But let's get to the beginning after all your work in the school system and all the other things that you've done, how did you get involved in becoming a Reiki practitioner and then working with the Akashic Records and doing healing and shamanic soul retrieval and all of that? Yeah, well, it, you know, it's interesting. I think once we enter the rabbit hole of, of, of expansion and raising our level of con consciousness to a higher level, uh, I guess there are certain things that come in our path that either we take as a vic victimizing ourselves with or we learn to grow from those experiences. And that's what happened to me. Uh, if you look at my childhood, there was traumatic, traumatic experiences that existed. Uh, I overrode those by, you know, being physically active and dealing with them when I needed to. But as I got older and I recognized uh, I was... Uh, working in a school building and i would every time i'd enter the gym i would develop these asthmatic feel these asthmatic symptoms and i saw doctors and they took care of it in a conventional medicine uh you know way but as i further were, was investigating uh one one of my co-workers who came up to me said uh, why don't you go to this, this friend of mine and so at that point in my life, I the only holistic approach that I really understood or knew was acupuncture and acupressure, which I used years before that. But as it related to anything to do with energy or anything outside of the body, uh, that wasn't something that I you know, didn't see was usually probably something that I would have either questioned or maybe turned away from. But to make a long story short, I visited this person who I called up on the phone and without me saying anything, the person said to me, you have asthma. So right there, I knew that there was a psychic connection or there was the person being able to access my energy. Uh, as, as it turned out, as I was visiting this person for over six years, uh, my intuition developed, my connection to the spiritual world um, became larger, and my ability to uh, do energy work and uh, help other people expanded. Uh, and so one thing led to, to another where the person was telling me about my past life, and that led to then me seeing more of the potential or the 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 soul's development, not just in this particular life. Uh, and then when I went from there and I saw that the Reiki, which this person was using on, you know, to help me had worked, then I recognized that this had I had the potential to learn something and develop something that would assist other people. And that wound up expanding itself from Reiki to the Akashic Records. So the Akashic Records, by the fact that the person told me about a past life, 
you know, sometimes there are synchroni- synchronized events in our lives where we just meet certain people or we read something or a person enters our life and, you know, pushes us further on our path. And one of the books I read was a book by the name of uh, One True Love by Gabrielle Law, who was an Akashic Record teacher. So I had a reading done with her. And the reading, you know, uh, elaborated on my past life uh, in terms of how it was affecting me today and some of the issues that I was dealing with, my breathing issues, uh, some of the phys- physiological things, psychological things were all tied to a past life in in Germany during World War II. Um, so I, I'm, I'm leaving it at that in terms of expanding upon where you uh, left off with asking me, if you <laughs> No, actually, no, that's fine. That's getting, uh, it's getting right into it. Now, okay. before... Before all of this started to happen um, in your earlier life, did you have any types of experiences uh, that were out of the ordinary? Anything that would give you a hint of what you would be working with eventually uh, as you got older? Uh, I would say that um, I always had an intuition, a knowing. Uh, certain times I would just say things, and I, you know, I knew what people were feeling. It was the un- an unconscious voice. Uh, that was that existed uh, that wasn't right directly in front of me per se at that moment, but it would either happen or I was onto something with understanding. Um, I guess what people are thinking, um, what what their motives were in in terms of from their thinking or the unspoken word, which was felt like in a in a vibrational way, an energetic way, which made it a little bit draining for me because I didn't understand it at the time. I thought it was just me being sensitive, overly sensitive to things and not understanding that there was energy being emitted from people and uh, how it can affect someone's energy field and affect, you know, being in the vicinity of them. And so you, ju- the you first... just described me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's a lot of people. Yeah, you, descri- of people. you described me, but when I tried to tell anyone about it, they don't believe you. They just don't believe you, you know. Well, right. Until it, it, it until something happens, and then you, I can turn around and say, "I told you so, Mark." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the the main the main thing that I've recognized um, as I travel on this path, uh, I do I do a I have a service what I, what is called Soul Prints, where I read the fingerprints of a person, um, which categorizes people into specific schools of 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 life. And what lessons that a person will go through. So for me, for example, my lessons in terms of life were actually to find my life's purpose of healing and helping people, which is where I'm at now. And how did I, how did I, what are some of the symptoms to get a person up that path is, is being, having trauma, uh, feeling the problems of other people. Yeah. And many times, many times what we do is instead of taking the, pro- the proactive steps and in, in going forward with it, we victimize ourselves by saying, poor me, poor me, poor me. And what that does is that never gives us the opportunity to spring out of the gate in order to find who we're supposed to be. That's so I would true. say, yeah. Mm. So, so I would say throughout my life, there's been always these moments of me having the potential to be victimized which yeah. was supposed to spring me to to actually take action to find my own power. Yeah. Interesting. How did you? How do you know this is um, can be found on the fifth parallel? Fifth dimension. Well, in terms. Okay. Well, in terms of in terms of scientifically, if it, if a person is in their left yeah. brain, right? Albert Einstein try to find a scientific explanation for the Akashic records and yeah. he made a discovery that that space exists between the smallest particles of atoms and and he, he called that space the four dimensional continuum and then it was a was a Nobel Peace Prize candidate named Irvin Laszlo who's a scientist who validated the existence of of the scientific view of the Akasha uh, it was a, he called it an inter, interconnecting field of information that like interwebs mm. every atom and cell and that connects everything and it responds to human emotion, and as he said, the field is accessible. So, yeah, and science has somewhat of a, 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 a an inkling or an understanding of the quantum field. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Don't you think so, Mark? Yes, and this is similar to what I was telling you earlier on. I, you know, I, I see it in my head like a big spider's web. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, mm. and you know, there's. Oh God, I'm tongue-tied now, because I I had one experience 
And I, I, I've mentioned on the show before, I'll keep it brief. I had one experience dealing with the Akashic Records about 15, no, oh, 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 good Lord, more like 18 years ago. Um, because I was working uh, with shamanism uh, and I did uh, take uh, training as a shamanic practitioner. So that's something else I want to talk to you about uh, later on. The right. I was doing a shamanic journey and I wound up in, to me, what looked like the Akashic Records. And, and it's how you would imagine it, it like the big giant library big columns huge you know bookshelves whatever going up you know like hundreds of feet and and it's books and scrolls and everything and in this this vision that i had uh i went over to this tiny little section that was me <laughs> and wow. like i had like barely one one part of a little shelf and Aww. but there was still a lot on there but i i pulled two scrolls out and not opening up and reading them, just pulling them out and then automatically getting information on two past lives. One was a man of power and one was a woman of servitude. And what I took away from that was uh, a balancing, uh, bringing balance to my life uh, in many different ways, including balancing the masculine and feminine energies, balancing just life itself, different experiences. And that was 15, you know, 18 years later, I can tell you that that is exactly what I needed and I, I had to work on for a number of years. So that's my only real experience with it. But then you mentioned something earlier about uh, how, you know, you, you, uh, Let's say someone has, and we've done some shows on near-death experiences, some people who've had a near-death experience, uh, and then when they cross over, and one of the things that they all experience is the life review. And it goes over yes. their entire life, every every single thing in their life. Now, is would you say that that is a point where they're accessing the Akashic Records to bring that information out? Yeah, I, I would definitely say that. I mean, it's... Uh, it's it's the it's the place located in that fifth dimension. It's the place where we're dreaming. It's the place where we're um, where where our ego is out of the way, so to speak. Gives us that um, it, that access point, that information point, um, which, as you say, in terms of reincarnation, of coming to the life review, it that's also located in that same same plane. Yes. So uh, when we're when we're accessing. When we're in that in that area, we're actually um, revisiting past karmas and through astral incarnations. Wow! I don't know if that answers. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The, the the information when we talk about the Akashic records. In fact, Irene and I were having a conversation about this before the show. It, we we most people tend to think of it as being like this big library or even as the bible mentioned the book of life so a book with all this information but all are really metaphors for something that really can't be described in the physical it's accessing certain information and i've always felt that that's something that part of our higher selves comes through that already is in contact in touch with all of that information when you mentioned edgar casey who would go into trance and he would have channel his own higher self that was connected with the akashic records and connected to all that information and I, and I feel like all of our higher selves to a one degree or another is connected to that or i should say they all are connected to it it depends on how much of that filters through down here <laughs> Well, it, 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 I think it, it's it's also our connection, our uh, our vibrational, uh, you know, footprint that we give off in, in terms of how we vibrate. Many times, when people access the Akashic records, they can receive a feeling in their body, and then they may not exactly see things or hear things or access any further information. But m most of the people will. Most people will actually, once they open up the Akashic records see see information hear information it's not a library per se as you mentioned 
It's more of a place, just like a book, where we store information, where we write notes, or where information is recorded. And so that's where the, 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 the word book of life or book would come from, where we record our deeds and our actions and the vibrational footprint of our, of our lives. So with the Kashuk records, how do we, what are ways that we can access those Akashic records? Well, the, the Akashic records from my, from my, not in my interpretation, from the, the way I access it is through a sacred prayer. And the prayer itself was handed down by the uh, Mayan tradition to a Spanish woman who by, uh, by a dream from a man by the name of Johnny Prezenska, uh, he had a dream of this woman passing the information down to him, the sacred prayer, and he met the woman down the street and she gave him the prayer. And this was this happened in Mexico. And uh, it was a very interesting thing. So in terms of my way of accessing the Akashic Records is through a sacred prayer that gives me that allows the eighth chakra, which is about 12 inches above my crown chakra on the top of my head to be in a state of receiving um, and to uh, be able to then access information based upon what I hear and see, but also based upon the questions that a client would ask me in terms of what they're trying to, to, to develop or what they're trying to see or understand in their lives. Now, how do the records, how do they assist you on our soul's journey? Well, in terms of in, the, the way they assist us is because it allows us to... Uh, have a soul connection uh, to allow our soul to hear information um, it, it, it pushes aside the ego mind which will then the chatter that will get in the way and create structure and we want to receive yes or no information which is ego satisfying um, but what the Akashic Records does is the prayer itself allows the soul to then step forward for the person, the masses and teachers who guide the person, they are in contact with the higher self of the person, the soul, and that soul then passes on information to 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 a person's you know person's life, it gives them access point. It helps them develop their um, a deeper connection to spirit, uh, to a more uh, profound um, way of developing from an internal, from a spiritual sense, from a soul level, uh, which is our true essence and our true purpose. And so accessing the Akashic Records will help a person's soul develop on a deeper level and expand and, and expand more. Adam, is it this prayer is not a prayer like you'd say in church, surely? It's more an affirmation? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a prayer. It's an access prayer that changes the vibration of, of the energy. Like, the an energy. like an affirmation. I wouldn't call it an affirmation. I would call it uh, asking or receiving. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's more of an asking and receiving type of information as opposed to an affirmation of just saying something with positivity and strength or, you know, internal knowing. It's asking yeah. for the guidance and protection from the, the universe when accessing this information. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Very interesting. Um, because, you know, anybody that I've spoken to about this before, they usually say, well, you say with your intention what you want to know and the answer will come back to you. Right. Well, that. yeah. Well, intention is, is, is manifesting. Mm -hmm. And first off, many people are a little bit sometimes they're stuck uh, in their ego mind. Uh, not knowing yeah. what their true purpose is and not being able to look at the traumas that they've experienced and and really deal with them and push them aside to some some extent so that they can really grow from the experience by using that as as a springboard. Many times we distract ourselves, we run away from the parts of ourselves we don't want to know and we want to just satisfy ourselves with external pleasures or yeah. materialism so that we don't have to deal with the in, inner world. So the Akashic Records is usually... Uh, an energy that will will give information that will help a person get in touch with their soul's purpose, and also have them develop uh, their develop their internal world to a greater greater extent, and yeah. also to to reveal past lives and the themes 
the themes that we've been living and need to overcome in each in in, the, in our present reincarnation, so that we don't repeat the same uh, issues, and that we grow from the past lives experience and and in this the present life that we live in. So the yeah. information that comes through from the Akashic Records helps a person uh, on a soul level, and that's the true real true personal growth, you know, in my opinion. Yeah, the people that I've ever been connected with that say that they access the records, they've all been humble people. Yeah, have well, you found, I, have you found that you know that then they're people that don't have an ego. Well, I think I think we all we, I know understand what you mean. We, I mean, we all have an hmm. ego, and, and yeah, we need I mean, a big ego. Own. Yeah, well, it's a it's a natural phenomenon, yeah. but I think that when we when we're in the ego state we're less receptive because we be, we feel we have to do things on our own. We right. feel like we don't have a connection to spirit, that we're not guided, that whatever fails, it's our, it's our fault, or whatever we succeed at, it's our doing. And mm -hmm. while that's true, there's also support from the spirit spiritual world that guides us and gives us information that helps us. And so when we're in a state, an ego state, we're less receptive and we're less, we are less, we have a less of an ability to then access information that will come in from the intuition, intuitive side of us, or from the, from the astral plane, from the Akashic records. So I yeah. think when we put our ego aside, put our ego aside by, by, by actually sitting still and listening. Well, I, th no, I think, yeah, sorry. No, no, go ahead. I think that if anything of this sort that you do, you better leave your ego at the door and, you know, you'll get better reactions. Right. If, if, a, if a person who's doing a reading for someone is in their ego, they really won't get the information from the Akashic Records. No. Because it'll be based upon a person actually saying, I can give you the information. I don't need anything else to support us or to get the information yeah um it, it becomes it becomes an energy that you feel and a knowing and when information comes through that validates things that people are going through or experiencing then you know you're in that place mm -hmm. well that's like yeah. with in <clears throat> in shamanic circles we call it being the hollow bone or even an empty vessel it's allowing yourself putting your ego aside putting your almost your personality aside and allowing those spiritual energies to come through and work through your body you're not the one doing it you're just the vessel that these energies are working through to conduct the healings or whatever it is that they're working with right right absolutely i mean uh it, it inquire it requires us whether male female or whatever uh, to be able to push aside the uh, the, the 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 male male brain, the the, the left brain, the structured brain, uh, or the part of us that that disconnects from the spiritual world and doesn't want to rely upon that, as I said before. So having having a balance within oneself of uh, of listening with wisdom and also deciphering the information and assisting other people and the desire to help other people from a place of, uh, of, of, of humility obviously will give off an energy which is genuine. And when a person's operating at a place of ego in, in, in feeling in control and uh, not allowing themselves to open up to the true essence of the universe, then we wind up using, we wind up, wind up using our ego as a support system you know, to get by, to, to be right, to win. Yeah, and I've known uh, too many too many people in the past who, psych whether they're your psychic medium or healers or whatnot, it's all about them. It's all about them promoting themselves and uh, trying to make a name for themselves so they could, uh, hey, work this full time and not being more humble and, and just allowing spirit to work through them and it not making it about them. Well, right. I, I think when I think when we, as I said before, operating at a place of authenticity and genuineness, then I think the universe supports us and gives us the guidance and and timing when things come and when people come in to assist them and when people seek certain people to help them. Um, I don't think people can genuinely force their way into 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 giving information or helping people if it's if it if that's the energy, then it is it is based upon ego. And there's really no uh, benefits that 
helps anyone because then it's in, it's controlling, and the energy is not located in the upper chakras. It's located more in the root chakra, which is control, and you know grounding, and you need both. We need a balance of both. Now you do shamanism as well, yes, Adam. I- I as do. well as right, as well as Reiki. Yeah, well, when in my my shamanic work, um, I studied under Itzhak Berry, who's a shamanic practitioner in New York City. He's the author of, I think, three books. Um, mm-hmm. And the, the the work that I've learned from him is stems out of the Andes tradition, which is uh, using obviously the masculine and feminine, the the earth and the sky in combination, and also removing energies that don't really work for a person that are around the, our energy chakras or, or yeah. body and clearing those energies out. And uh, along with that, I do uh, soul retrieval, um, accessing the person's traumas and seeing the parts of themselves that they disregarded from their lives in order to incorporate that back and create a sense of wholeness and uh, wellness for a person. You know, most of our illnesses begin on an emotional level when we don't deal with those traumas and we don't pay attention to them. They creep into our energy field and make us physically sick. So, mm-hmm. so my shamanic work is is based upon um, incorporating the uh, the energies of the earth and the energies yeah. of the heavens in combination, and creating a sense of balance and uh, in, incorporating the masculine and feminine energies in in balance, so that a person is 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 is, is experiences a state of equilibrium. I see. I see. So I. With the Reiki, with this shamanism and one thing or another, bringing in the records as well, it's all kind of gels together, yes? Uh, I would say yes. Mm. Um, the energy okay. itself is, feels somewhat familiar. I mean, when I when you journey, journeying is drumming or r- using a rattle to stimulate a certain brainwave so that the ego then f- like falls asleep almost like in a dream. And then the information that you're seeking for a person or for yourself then then comes through. It's like it's like the 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 door is open, and then yeah. the, the information, our unconscious connection to the universe, is revealed. And much of the the many of the sessions I have, um, I hear and see things in a different way. Um, in in accessing that that energy field, the akashic records is through a prayer, and shamanism is through drumming or through rattling. And yeah. There's a similar, there's a similar energy to it, that. Yes, it's like I'm a remote viewer, so if I want to get or get into any altered consciousness, I use bin. I can't say the word now. Bind mark. Binaural, binaural beats. beats. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Binaural yes. beats. Yeah. Yes, I understand. Which right. is similar to the drumming and everything that yes. you use in shamanism. Yep. Absolutely. Mm. No, yeah. fantastic. You know, I had uh, was trained under uh, some. My teachers worked with. I don't know if you've heard of Sandra Ingerman, who's written dozens, yes, I have. dozens uh-huh. of books. I have. And yes, yes, she. Um, I I was learning. I learned of uh, the soul retrieval. Uh, performed it myself, and uh, really interesting experience with that too. Because again, what, when you are Mark, sorry, what about? explaining a bit about what soul retrieval is i was i was getting into that actually adam already explained a part (gasps) of it yes (laughs) oh sorry sorry. that's okay no it's no uh, yeah it's true i get asked questions you know from people like the the normal housewife that's doing her washing up or something (laughs) (laughs) well no adam explained it earlier it's just uh i'll just summarize it's again it's going within to find those pieces of a person who's who suffered some type of traumatic event or some event in their life that almost like break breaks off a piece of yourself a piece of the soul and it sticks it somewhere or it's stuck in the past or it's stuck in some level and dimension and through this practice of soul retrieval it's going and f- using your guides uh traveling to whichever dimension it is whether it's the upper middle or lower world finding where it is finding out where that trauma happened and then bringing it back to the person so that they feel more whole and like you said with with you know having you can have many fractures you can have dozens of fractures in your life uh, depending on different types of trauma or experiences you've had and with soul retrieval you're going to find 
usually what that person most needs right now. You're not doing everything at once, but what is that person most in need of in terms of healing? Yep, exactly. Yes. Good. I made I, I made sense. <laughs> uh, very good. Excellent. You can also question now, Mark. Uh, you know, we have we, we, throughout our lives we we become fragmented. Uh, we all have certain you know aspects of fragmentation of our soul. It's like a, a computer disk that loses its its. Uh, it's at memory, or so to speak, or you, sometimes we used to have to fragment a disk or a hard drive because it becomes like separate. Um, we we experience traumas and stresses on different levels. What's stressful for one person may not be stressful for another person. But in essence, it's that feeling of wanting to leave the stress that we're experiencing. And many times in conventional medicine, it would be considered almost like schizophrenia when the soul is actually dissociated from the body and is not in reality. Um, and it could be seen in some ways as a as a, a portion of a person's soul out of the body, and that's that's a normal. Uh, I don't know if it's used the word normal, but it is a response by the by the person to to handle a situation that they no longer can deal with. So a part of them will just leave to not deal with that stress, and that makes makes sense because you know just when a person also when a person experiences a near death experience, their soul leaves the body because they're experiencing a high traumatic situation, high traumatic and dramatic situation where their soul actually exits the body. So in some capacity, when we're living, we experience that fragmentation of parts of it leaving, and we feel we feel imbalanced and we feel uh, we're not whole and the job of a shaman is to find that those traumas that the person doesn't see doesn't want to deal with and to ask if they really want to incorporate that and bring that back into the body i mean if a person doesn't want to bring it back then they don't bring it back it won't be incorporated into the into the person's soul i see yeah what was it mark you wanted to ask something and now I completely forgot. So <laughs> we'll, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry about that. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, with uh, the work that you do, uh, you know, we've, we've been to your, your website, uh, which we're happy to plug, which is adamgaluniversalhealing.com. And you work with people in setting up uh, remotely. Or, uh, or is it in, in person? The, it, no, well, I mean I can do the work in person, but obviously when I'm doing sh um, when I'm doing Akashic record readings, I do the readings via Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, person make you know makes an appointment and uh, it's an hour session, um, and I have my clients uh, prepare with questions that are high end questions, and usually you, then person would receive high end information uh, from their masters and teachers. In other words. When we ask questions in life that will I get that job, yes or no, um, will I get that house or will I have that relationship, uh, those are, as I said earlier, those are like yes or no ego-based questions. And so when a person is responding or when they ask questions of like what do I need to do in order to change this relationship or what do I need to do with my – what do I need to work on myself in order to have a better relationship or you know, what do I need to do to get that job? Uh, those are the types of questions that, you know, people usually uh, ask or I, I forward them to ask sp sp uh, questions that are geared toward that so that more, higher energy comes through and it actually hits this. Hits, it's more of a soul, soul information. Adam, going back to soul retrieval, can you have that done more than once? Well, Absolutely. Because each time, as we as we as we our level of consciousness increases, yeah. we are then become more open towards the understanding of accepting ourselves. And don't forget, most of our traumas are from childhood. Yeah. Uh, and and those childhood traumas uh, usually are the parts of ourselves that we leave behind. Like we can't even look at a photo of ourselves, or as a part in our lives we don't want to think about. And so. Um, a person can definitely have more than one soul retrieval because, as I just said, they'll be more accepting of incorporating the parts that they might have rejected from themselves as they as they go go on this journey. Mm -hmm. An interesting thing that I usually tell my clients and what I see through the Akashic Records is to actually find a photo of the time where the trauma or stress existed. 
and to try to incorporate that back into your life, which is difficult for people to look at times in their lives uh, where they weren't the happiest or where they experienced certain trauma. But when we reject that part of ourselves, we reject a portion of our entirety and we lose part of ourselves in that process. And usually it's not ourselves who wanted to really lose part of ourselves. It's the circumstances that did it to us. And, and once you've had it done, you feel whole again. You feel... Well, each it, it depends. It, and each person is different. Each person reacts yeah. different to any type of uh, modality. Uh, but for the most part, the intention is to incorporate that back to make the person more aware of their part of parts of themselves that they've dismissed. Yeah. And to ask the higher self to incorporate it back in. There's also, I, I know a lot of trauma can happen in childhood, but there's also many things we as adults can experience, some in, exceptionally traumatic uh, events Absolutely. that could break off a part of you or whatnot, that a soul retrieval in time would, would be beneficial. That, yeah, I I revert I revert back to to, to most of our traumas because um, usually the foundation of 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 how we reacted to initial traumas is somehow how we react to future traumas in our lives, and that pattern of how we've handled things in the past is the way we have a tendency to handle things in the future, and so in in from my understanding, absolutely we're going to experience traumas in our lives, uh, having dismissed parts of ourselves make it makes it a little bit more difficult to then deal with the traumas in our adult self having not been able to do it when we were younger which is natural yeah exactly and and soul retrieval is just one of many different types of uh healings that can be done on a person both with shamanic or using reiki or any number right, right. of healing techniques depends on Correct. what what the what the person really needs that's well I, I i use i also use what is known as la limpia which is taking an egg and clearing the energy centers around the body uh for, through the body itself and through the specific chakras and because since an egg is porous it absorbs a lot of negative energy and, and the heavy energies of the body and sometimes i've noticed working on, on clients that the egg is cracked um and uh become heavier by picking up an energy or picking up any any other energies itself yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. Now you've also with your with your Reiki work, um, and you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. I can never pronounce it right. It's Reiki, Reiki. I mean, what, what's the uh, correct pronunciation? I, I call it Reiki. Reiki. Yeah. Reiki. That's what I, I do Reiki. too. But I've heard other people call it Reiki, and like, okay, not sure. But um, now with that type of work, I, as I understand it, is usually you're you're envisioning the energy field around a person and manipulating those energy fields to bring types of healing or could you explain that in a little bit better terms yeah, than I well, can? I, I, yeah most most of the reiki work i do is distance reiki i'm accessing the person's energetic field through my unconscious mind through that through the through the um, non-locality of 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 the quantum field mm -hmm. uh it's it's the it's setting the intention it's it's breathing it's visualizations and powerful intent, and it's, it's it's remarkable how people will actually feel the connection and the disconnect when the sessions are finished. Uh, there is there's there's a feeling I, I usually can feel in my hands different places from a distance. You know, if I scan the person to see where there's heavier energies or where there's there's, there's blockages. And what I incorporate is I, I incorporate the removal of those energies through visualizations, but also through specific uh, chakra sounds, which vibrate at uh, resonate at the same uh, sound, uh, frequency as the particular chakra. So the specific chanting I, were, I use, that actually dislodges uh, because that frequency or that chant that I'm using will access that particular chakra. Uh, and also the removal. Um, through the sounds and then incorporating and, and and clearing out the chakras themselves and then closing the shock clearing closing the chakras and also using vibrational sounds as well but in terms of the reiki itself the reiki is is 
is the power of intent. And there's so many different studies that you know have shown uh, its its effectiveness and its its ability to actually you know enter a person's energetic field. Um, I've worked with many clients, and you know I'm working in a specific area, and they said I felt it here, and I saw the specific color. And that's actually the colors that I'm working with with the person. So, it's it's fascinating to 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 describe how it works. How it works, I can't really say per se, you know. But I, it does have an effect. Now, how long have you actually been working with uh, performing uh, these types of healings? I would say since 2015. So about seven years, seven eight years now. Okay. And yeah. now part of with your journey, and, and again, I'm, 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 I'm taking a look at your, your bio because there's a couple things on here that seem a little out of left field and I really would like some more information on. Uh, now, it mentioned something about a UFO experience. Yeah, well, um, I've always had, I, I wouldn't say I've always had a fascination. I guess it's been, a, it's been uh, an interesting path for me to uncover things in life I, like I said earlier when we first got on that I think once you enter the rabbit hole of of expansion and once you've like blown on that balloon that's very difficult to blow up, and you blow it up and it becomes bigger you you've you've already expanded and so I think all that information then gives you this 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 vastness of what exists that's not shown on the surface of our lives uh, for myself I had maybe two years ago I was on the beach here in New Jersey, uh, sitting with my girlfriend on in the chair about one o'clock in the afternoon. It was it was a busy day, and all of a sudden I looked up to the right. I don't know why I looked up. I looked up, and about maybe four four hundred feet off the shoreline was a, a looked like a balloon at first, but then turned into a disc, and then traveled on a forty five degree angle up into the clouds, and uh, I was perplexed. I said to myself, "Is that a balloon?" And I said, "It can't be a balloon." First, it was hovering, and then it moved in a one direction. And it shape shifted from one shape to another, starting off like a balloon, then to almost like a flat disc disc shape. I was uh, going to say it's not a Chinese spy balloon, is it? <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. No. Yeah. I don't Sorry, I had to. Get, I had to get that dig in. Um, yeah, I understand. No. Um, yeah, so I had that experience of of that, uh, and nobody else was looking up in the direction. Normally, like if something would be profound, like if there's a dolphin or a whale in the water, people are looking straight ahead, they'll say, oh, look, look ahead, and everybody is standing up pointing. But there was nobody looking up at the direction where I was except myself. So I found it rather interesting. Uh, and then that winter, I had an experience driving on the Jersey Turnpike in the wintertime, and like a blue Roman candle uh, exploded over my car, maybe about three, two, three hundred feet above the car, probably less, because I saw right out the front window in front of my car. Uh, I don't know what it was. Um, it certainly wasn't summertime. It wasn't the Fourth of July, and it was a pretty interesting and profound moment. It was a blue light that just like went off right in front of my car. You know, which those types of events signal to me that you're possibly involved, maybe on an un unconscious level, with higher levels of entities or beings, whether they're on this, what we would think of on the spiritual plane, etheric plane, or maybe even interdimensional plane. Yeah. And like a lot yeah. of people who have these UFO experiences or people we've interviewed um uh, experiencers, abductees, and who've had these experiences, and afterwards they've also developed very high psychic abilities. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I, I would say that I've met people who, uh, or I've made contact with people who are on uh, different avenues of, of, of this thinking who are from Who've, who've said that from different planets. Um, and I do feel, because I've seen in my mind's eye, uh, almost, I guess, a gray, uh, gray shape uh, alien uh, communicating in some way. I don't know, I wouldn't say verbally communicating, but seeing it visually. Uh, and it's funny, I had a friend of mine who did a, a, a healing on me last two weeks ago. Uh, and he, that that evening is the day before I actually had in my mind's eye, and mind's eye as I was meditating, saw this alien face. And as he did the work, the next day, he said, you know, I see this very galactic energy around you and this alien face. And he described the face and it was the face that I saw within me. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I as you said, I believe that there are uh, ways for 
people who are on this path and developing a higher sense of consciousness or awareness to be then maybe contacted in some indirect way, uh, whether it be me and thousands of other people or whoever it may be, I do believe those experiences lend themselves to that type of connection. Now, um, you have also were a uh, or are a documentary filmmaker. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your film? Yeah, absolutely. Um, through, I grew up in Brooklyn, um, and as a child growing up, growing up in Brooklyn, I grew up with a very multi-ethnic, ethnic, you know, neighborhood. Uh, played all different types of sports. Uh, when I had my traumas and problems in my house, the first place I'd run to was my grandmother's house, and she lived about a block and a half away from where I lived. Um, through my childhood, I'd visit her often. She'd cook me soup or food or whatever it was, but she always wanted me to look at her photo albums. So she would take out these photo albums from prior to World War II, the world war years and the, the, the years after the war. Uh, she was from the northern part of Russia, which was actually an indigenous uh indigenous language and culture called the Komi people, but they were part of Russia and they, the letters were written in Cyrillic. Uh, so as a child, when I went to my grandmother's house, she would take out photo albums and I would look through the photo albums and I came across a man in a, a military uniform amongst people with snowy scenes and fur hats on and like, you know, wintry scenes. I asked my grandmother who this person was and she said, this is your grandfather. And I, at seven, I said, it doesn't look like my grandfather that I know. So I came home to my father and I told him, after all our little stresses that, that existed, I said, Dad, I saw a picture of your father. And he, said, he, he was a soldier. And my father said, leave me alone. I don't want to talk about that. So oh. as the, yeah. So as the years progressed, I would ask my grandmother a little bit more. And I wound up finding out that that was my father's biological father, who was a soldier in World War II. He was a ski soldier uh, and a political officer on the, in the Battle of Moscow. Um, as, as it went along, my father, I'd ask my father further questions and all he would tell me is, I remember now, grandma used to show me a picture of him and I would, she would cry and I would cry. And that was the end of the story. I said, did you know his name? Did you know who he was? He goes, I don't know anything about him. So from hearing that, and that was after my grandmother passed away, al along with asking my father these questions. Um, I, my grandmother had a box of photo albums and, um, at the very bottom of the photo albums that I would look through as, as a child to see this person uh, off and on when I went into my grandmother's uh, bedroom, um, she had a diary, diaries written that were tucked underneath the photo albums and they were written in, in the Comey language, the language of her, her indigenous people where she came from. And I opened them up and I saw pages with like, look like tears, like that smudged the, the, the ink. And in there, I saw a death certificate of a soldier. Um, and I looked it over and I was able to translate it because that was written in Russian. And it was it, it explained that who the person was, my, the name and where yeah. the person died, where he was killed uh, and, and so on and so forth. So to make a long story short, I wound up contacting and finding his his family, his relatives, my father's biological relatives in northern Russia. I was on a website there, and I put a, a, put up letters and pictures, and I found the family of my biological grandfather, and I mm -hmm. united. I went back to Russia. I went to the uh, mass graves, and I found his body. Uh, I found the family, and uh, they made a big story in 2011 about my um, my visit there, and what I did and what I accomplished. And I made a documentary film, which played in the film festivals here in New York and in Asbury, New Jersey, in 2018-2019. Uh, oh, fantastic. And yeah, yeah. So I have my – that it, the, the film itself is on YouTube. It, the name of the movie was is called Forgotten. Forgotten. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Definitely going to have to check that out. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Well, um, yeah, so that was, that was, that was, the, that was a, actually, I, I as, a, as a landscape photographer, I actually undertook this, 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 this job, so to speak. Yeah. On a, on a, on a, uh, let's say on a cinematic uh, um, uh, challenge for myself, mm -hmm. obviously more so to actually tell a story of how in life famous people are remembered but the common person also suffered and had a life as well, and they need to be validated no matter who they are, and that no one should ever be forgotten. 
because that's when the soul is really is dead. But when you mm. keep a person's memory alive, so many times in families, people are ashamed or told to shut people out of the family in order to keep the peace, so to speak, or yeah. to not not turn over stones that were already turned over and a lot of information sometimes never gets through but i i I viewed it actually through my own my own life because i was going through a difficult divorce and because uh the communication with my children broke down over a long period of time and i felt that loneliness i felt the the forgotten feeling of being forgotten possibly and what happens in life if we live a life and we have children or we have people who love us but all of a sudden once the person's gone we don't forget about we don't think about them anymore so for me it was very important to try to bring back the memory of my grandfather so that his his memory would not have been forgotten and that his soul would live on and as they say when you heal the generation you heal yourself you heal the generations before you two generations before you and you heal two two generations after you and that was my intention was to to bring peace to understand where I, my father's stress began and why he came home uh, stressed from work and really what the cause of his trauma was that he didn't know how to handle but imparted onto me and i think there's always someone in a family who has that capacity or desire to uncover or to be the person to question things and that was me that's a, you know that is a really heart-touching story yes that really it is, is. Mm. fantastic well i definitely want to see that film forgotten on youtube so we'll check it out uh, yeah. adam we are coming to the end of the program here so uh first of all i want to plug your website again uh where can people go and, and reach out to you sure my website is adam gell universal healing.com uh i offer different services a person can you know read up a little bit about it and see um, if they're interested um and uh, i also have my podcast which is conversations with adam gell and inspiring minds fantastic and and where yep and the podcast is where on youtube well that's on youtube yes it's a youtube podcast okay fantastic Uh well adam thank you again for coming on the show tonight this has been uh very enlightening and uh it's it's interesting when i can talk to somebody who has who's gone through some similar experiences so thank you again for coming on yeah, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to share some of my information with you and the audience. So okay. so thank you so much, both of you. And, and uh, I want to thank uh, everybody else for tuning in to another edition of the Paranormal UK radio show, the flagship show here on the Paranormal UK radio network. And Irene, where can anybody find us? Everywhere, people are everywhere. <laughs> All right, everyone, you have a great week we will be back in two weeks and uh so be good humans we'll talk to you soon okay bye